Hello and welcome to the interview on France 24. I'm Delano D'Souza. My guest this week is Imran Ahmed, the founder and chief executive of the Business of Fashion, a company which over the years has become a reference for the fashion industry. Imran, great to have you here on the program today. Lovely to be with you. You started the BOF 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a long time. What was it like to start out in an industry where you were considered an outsider? Well, it came with its challenges, uh, no doubt. But, you know, I think the industry was at a point of change. Uh, there was a revolution that was about to happen with the dawn of social media. The iPhone launched the same year that I started writing the website, um, which was a blog at the time. I used to write it from my sofa. And the industry was just on the cusp of all of this, this change. And I think having an outsider's perspective, having not come from the fashion industry, actually ended up being a benefit. You know, I definitely faced barriers and, you know, people were not necessarily opening their doors to me at the beginning. But when I started writing and sharing my ideas on how some of these changes in the technological landscape, with the globalization of fashion, with the shift in the economy, um, people started listening. And I think ideas can open doors. Let, uh, let Let's talk about the path which you had set for you, because you had this sort of traditional upbringing, so to speak. You went to, uh, you studied business, then you joined uh, Deloitte, then you went to Harvard to do your MBA. Uh, you were working at McKinsey in London. It seems that things were already set for you. You could mm -hmm. have had a very uh, stable, cushy life, but at some point you decided you want something else. You needed to take a break from the path you were, were on uh, to change it up. Why? Well, I guess like many uh, overachievers, I had been set out on this path uh, early on uh, by my parents. You know, there was my parents had immigrated from East Africa to Canada in the 1970s. Uh, they didn't come to the country with very much. And we were, you know, focusing uh, on building a new life in Canada. And, and part of that was on having a very secure, stable um, financial position and educational background. Mm -hmm. And once I'd achieved those things, I realized they weren't really sparking much joy in my life. And actually having experience like that enabled me to take risks. It enabled me to, to kind of step off that very, very well-trod path and, and try something different, try something you know, more related to the creative side of things, which is what I was always drawn to. Was there something that you felt was missing when it came to fashion journalism? Well, I actually didn't even set out to be a journalist at the beginning. I actually set up an incubator for young fashion designers. Uh, the idea there was, you know, there was this, this divide between the business side of fashion and the creative side of fashion. I'd meet, met all of these young fashion designers coming out of the fashion schools in London, and they weren't equipped to deal with all of the realities of running a business. I mm. mean, many, think, many people think of fashion as an art, and it's certainly creative, and there's artistic elements to it. But fundamentally, it's a business. It's a business. You need a business to sustain the creativity. And this is not really taught to fashion designers in, in, uh, in school. So I set up this incubator. It didn't last. It only lasted eight months. Um, but it was during that time that I started penning this personal blog for my friends and family. And so I didn't think I would become a journalist. It was only when the incubator didn't work out, I took the password off and started writing. And journalism has been something I've had to learn by doing, really. You, you held a gala this past weekend. Yeah. Uh, it, it drew in a lot of big names. Uh, how did you manage to gain that sort of influence within the industry in sh such a short amount of time, 16 years? Uh, is it because you were filling this gap that no one else had managed to fill? I think there was a, a void or a gap in the market for real analytical journalism about the fashion business. You know, there was a lot of fashion media. We all know the glossy fashion titles like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. And, you know, we were doing something different from the start. We were trying to look at the industry as a business. We were looking at it globally. We weren't looking at it with an, a North American lens or a European lens or an Asian lens. We were looking at it with a global lens. And we were doing it in such a way that it was, you know, journalism that could help people. You know, it was, it, fundamentally what we do is advise people on how they should be thinking about navigating their businesses, um, how they should prepare for the things that are changing in the world, whether that be climate change or technological change, and how they should, you know, um, immerse themselves in, in what's happening in the industry. And they can find all of that at, at the business of fashion. Now, you recently released a list of the 
100 most influential uh, additions uh, to the BOF 500. These are, of course, people you consider to be shaping the fashion industry. And they, they range from people within the industry, but also muses, artists, entrepreneurs, etc. People like Carol G, Pharrell, Bad Bunny. How do you go about compiling this list? It's a question I get asked a lot, so it's, I'm glad you asked me. Um, we start with nominations uh, and our existing BOF 500 community, which now numbers more than 1,100 people because we've been adding 100 names to the list pretty much since we started. We go to that community and say, well, who in your market, who in your area of expertise, who in your sphere of influence do you think is having an impact? We also talk to our editorial team who are also based all over the world and are in the ins and outs of their daily work are encountering some of the people who are shaping the industry. We have trusted resources and sources in the Middle East, in you know, Asia, all over South America. And we put all of these nominations together and then our team does a lot of research this year. We, I think our team said we developed 308 research packs. And then there's a debate amongst our editors. And we have a conversation, we go through every profile, we have a discussion, understand what the work they've been focusing on and how they're impacting the industry. And then we whittle it down slowly but surely to 100 names. Do you, do you make a conscious effort to, to try and get people from all around the world? It's certainly one of the things that's front of mind, but I would say we don't like set any target. You know, we don't say we need it to cover, you know, this many countries. It just happens organically because the community of people we're talking to is a global community. If we're talking to people in Nigeria, if we're talking to people in Brazil, if we're talking to people in India, they're obviously suggesting those names. So it happens very organically. I want to talk about diversity within the fashion industry because mm -hmm. this is something that obviously gained uh, a lot of uh, momentum in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. And then we've seen uh, certain editors, uh, like the editor of British Vogue, who's made a push for more diversity, more inclusion within the fashion industry. But it seems that change is coming in in drips and drabs, not really uh, uh, as quickly as people would like to see. What do you think is is uh, is causing this reluctance within the fashion industry? Systemic change takes time. And I think, obviously, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, which you know really accelerated after the murder of George Floyd, really put it, that focus not just in fashion, but everywhere, you know, people were really looking inside their systems and organizations to understand, you know, what are the things that we need to shift? There's certainly more awareness of it, but as a, you know, person of color working in this industry, I still encounter a lot of, you know, unusual, unexpected challenges, even in the position that I hold today, where people just do not generally understand uh, the, the differences that they must embrace in order to create real change. Can you give me an example? Well, I, you know, my, I'm, con I'm regularly, you know, mixed up with other brown people. You know, I have been sent flowers that belong to, were intended for someone else because we share uh, a, a surname. I am regularly mistaken for other people just because people can't really tell the difference between mm -hmm. some of us. Um, and, and some of those things are things at the surface. And of course, you know, you know, but I think on a deeper level, you know, there have been situations where, um, you know, I think the industry has not really fully understand or embraced people who are different. And I think I think there is um, there is awareness. But it seems that there's this lack of diversity, not only at the top when it comes to top management, but also when it comes to designers. Mm -hmm. A lot of um, designers designing women's clothes, for instance, are men. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, if we if we look, you know, that's starting to change. We have Virginie Villar, who's at Chanel. We have, yeah. um, you know, Maria Grazia Curie, who's at Dior. You know, we have designers like Phoebe Philo, who's you know just about to relaunch or launch her new brand. So there's still very prominent women in the industry. Uh, Lena Nair, the new global CEO of Chanel, is a yeah. woman of color from India. So, you know, these things take time. Um, I, I'm seeing some progress, and I think you know that progress is you know something that we need to acknowledge. But we're not at a point yet where the the people who are running, um, designing, uh, managing the fashion industry reflect truly the global customer base that customer base that they go after. And that's one of the reasons we created the BOF 500, which was really to create more visibility that you know this industry isn't just a white. Western European industry. It is a global industry. Indeed, and the, the importance is that customers are coming from all over the world, not necessarily 
the West. Uh, let's talk about uh, the company, your plans for the future, because you do have, of course, uh, the BOF 500, which we've spoken about. You have uh, Voices, which is a sort of event that brings together insiders and outsiders uh, of the industry and sort of looks towards the future uh, of fashion. You have a podcast. What's next for you? Well, you know, the business of the business of fashion is really rests on our, our subscriptions, our membership program. You know, like other media publications, we've learned that by creating meaningful, valuable, hard to get anywhere else content, you know, people will pay for it. And really, that's the fundamental of our business. Those are the that's the, what drives the growth and success of the business. But we're adding, you know, new elements to the business. We've just launched the business of beauty, which is a new uh, vertical focused on a huge adjacent sector to the fashion industry, which you know we haven't been covering in the same depth up until now. We've recently expanded that team. Oh, to cover the beauty industry. Okay. Exactly. We've got a, a new division called BOF Insights, which is an analytical think tank. We we like to think of it as our version of the Economist Intelligence Unit. You know, mm -hmm. we're taking that ana same left brain, right brain analytical thinking that we have brought to our journalism, and we're applying it in more. Um, in reports and in advice for the industry. So, you know, there's always things going on at BOF about you know, where we can expand, how we can evolve, how we can take that same unique perspective that we brought through our journalism and apply it in other ways. Iran, thank you so much for taking the time out during a very busy, uh, bu busy uh, uh, Paris Fashion Week and coming in uh, to talk to us here at Fashion Week. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Iran. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much for watching.